Today's edition of Mac Voices is supported by Jamf and their Jamf Now software that helps you manage your Apple devices from anywhere. Get started by setting up your first three devices free at jamf.com slash macvoices. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, we're back after a little bit of a hiatus, and I'll tell you about why at some point in the future. But um, let's just say that we're back, and I thought it would be good to get back into it with uh, one of our five question shows. At this time, I couldn't think of anyone whose, whose skull I would like to probe more than Mr. Peter Cohen. Peter, welcome. I'll try, to, I'll try not to get a little bit aroused by that, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> skull, Peter, skull. <laughs> so, hey, if, that, if, that's your, if that's your thing, baby. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is why. This is why. <laughs> for those of you that haven't been here for a five question show, basically, I've asked our guest five questions that I would like to know about them. And hopefully along the way, we learn something about them. But also, we learn something that, that may make us a little more efficient or maybe do something a little more with, with our Apple tech. So with that, Peter, are you are you ready? I sure am, Chuck. Let's get started. All right, all right. So first off, this is not one of the five questions. Can you give me a, a brief rundown of of your Apple gear, your laptops, your desktops, uh, watches, phones, anything else that you that you use on a regular basis? You bet. First of all, let me tell you, I am a big believer in getting the most out of the hardware that you have. So not all the stuff that I've got is cutting edge. Uh, you, I think you might be a little bit surprised. I'm using a, uh, a 2015-era uh, uh, MacBook Pro, a 15-inch model. Uh, I love the 15-inch model. I haven't gotten touch bar yet because this one suits my needs perfectly, and I really don't feel the need to, uh, uh, to upgrade right now. And it's still running like a champ. Um, so that's my main workstation. That's what I do probably about 85% of my, my work on. I also have a Mac mini that I use for, uh, some server applications and some other stuff. Um, and, and uh, it's sort of my, uh, uh, my little test bed computer that, that I like to play around with, uh, because it's, uh, sort of harmless and innocent and it deserves to be abused every once in a while. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, an iPhone 6 Plus. Uh, I love the larger sized iPhone. I will never go to a smaller iPhone again if I can avoid it. Um, and an Apple Watch, a Series Zero Apple Watch that I, I got in, in June, the year they came out, and have worn almost every day since. Hmm. Okay. Apple TVs? Yeah, I've got a second and third generation. I don't, however, have a fourth generation. Okay. Um, if you f Forgive me. If you said it, I missed it. iPads? Uh, you know what? I'm between iPads right now. I had a third generation iPad for a very long time. Um, and, well, you know, once Apple kind of uh, 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 sunset it, if you will, uh, with support for modern operating systems, I put it down and I really haven't picked it up again. And I really don't feel the need to. The iPhone 6 Plus does everything that a portable device needs or that I need from a portable device in a screen form factor that's perfect for me. It replaced my iPad. Hmm, that's surprising. I've I've heard people say that kind of thing as to the justification for why they don't buy an iPad. I'm not sure I've heard anyone though say they put down an iPad and didn't pick another one back up, or at least didn't didn't plan to pick back one back up in the future. Well, you know, Chuck, the thing the thing is, I guess my use case is is obviously we're we're all kind of specific to the way that we use our machines, and and nobody's. Uh, set up and nobody's workflow is going to be exactly the same. Now I'm a, I'm a writer and you know I spend most of my day writing uh, 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 from a keyboard because I'm much more comfortable inputting um, uh, the the stuff that I'm doing on a keyboard than I am using any other kind of interface. Uh, I had a really rough time with the iPad uh, in terms of actually trying to use the screen for input, uh, and then even with an external keyboard, I felt it was kind of like a kludge because I still had to kept break, breaking that plane, you know taking my hands off the keyboard, putting them on the screen, touching the screen. Uh, that is just not a user experience that I found particularly um, uh, conducive to what I do. So I stick with, uh, I dance with the one that brung me, uh, as the old saying goes, and I stick with the, the keyboard uh, and the trackpad that I've used for nigh on two decades now. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so let's start with your writing. Because that's probably what you're best known for. Sure. Um, what are your writing tools of choice? Do you have preferred programs, or do you just work in text edit and then paste it into content management systems, or how does that process work for you? 
obviously a lot of it depends on the particular clients that I'm working with. Now I'm a freelancer these days. So, um, you know, my, the, 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 the businesses that I work with may have specific requirements for formatting, uh, or may even want me to use specific workflows like Google docs, for example, is very popular. And, uh, Microsoft word obviously is ubiquitous. Uh, but when it comes to my own, uh, day-to-day workflow, when I'm doing creative work or when I'm, uh, working on content that I have control over Ulysses, um, is the, the app of choice. Um, I love Ulysses. The reason why I love Ulysses is because, uh, first of all, uh, syncing in the cloud through iSync is effortless, absolutely effortless. Secondly, syncing between devices is effortless, too. Um, So I don't have to worry about uh, making sure that my content is synced between my phone, for example, and uh, my Mac. I can pick up a document that I've been working on my Mac on my phone when I'm in line at Starbucks and just tap in or even use Siri to dictate a couple of sentences that I have, you know, that I'm riffing on and then just close it, you know, finish my order at Starbucks, go out the door. And uh, then when I get back home, everything is still synced. That is a beautiful workflow that I'm very happy to be able to use. You're not the first one I've heard uh, that has described that that workflow and that ease, um, and and I I have to go down this rat hole just a little bit. Um, and this is I not, know I, I know what's coming, Chuck. Yeah, go go yeah, for it because yeah. you know I've got strong opinions on this. I, I know you do. Um, U- Ulysses has just changed to a subscription model now. For legacy folks, you get get a discount, which is absolutely appropriate, and I applaud them for that. How, how do you feel about this, though? Is this for what Ulysses does? Is this uh, a, a deal breaker for you, or are you hearty and heartily enthusing it, endorsing it? Oh, I'm, I, I was I was in when 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 I read about it. Look, developers need to make money. Developers need to eat. Developers do not survive on photosynthesis. You know, they don't just grab oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide out of the air and 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 make oxygen. You know, they they. Uh, are living, breathing creatures just like the rest of us, and they need to eat. People aren't buying software like they used to. Uh, What's more, when people buy software, when you just pay one time for software but you continue to use it, um, if that developer, if you're expecting that developer to make increments to that software, if you're expecting that developer to to, uh, be able to continue to support that software, you have to be able to throw that developer, you know, a little little taste every once in a while. a lot of companies have switched over to subscription models. You know, Microsoft, for example, has really pushed it with Office 365, although they still do offer a, uh, a standalone app that you have, or a standalone Office suite that you can buy. Uh, uh, most famously, of course, Adobe, you know, has moved their Creative Cloud services to the cloud. I'm a Creative Cloud subscriber too. I have no compunction whatsoever about uh, tithing a little bit to both Microsoft and Adobe uh, every month because that's uh, you know a, a sensible use of my money and, and you know what it's it, it is a, a budgetable expense it's a budgetable expense from month to month i know my software bill is going to be x dollars every month just like i know that my entertainment bill between my cable and and my apple music and uh whatever else i netflix you know i i i, I can calculate that from month to month so i don't have any compunction whatsoever about um, developers charging the subscription model. The trick is that you've got to have an ecosystem and a product that's worth it uh, to your user base to subscribe uh, to. Now, the, the complaint that I've heard from many people is the death of a thousand cuts, if you will. You know, I, I can't be bothered to subscribe here and subscribe there. Well, they're, they're right. And there are services like um, uh, MacPaw's Setup, for example, uh, which resolve that because uh, that sort of applies the Apple Music model uh, to to software subscriptions. You know, you pay this company a set fee, ten dollars a month, and you have all these apps unlocked for as long as you have your subscription. You end your subscription. You know, the, the, you're locked out of the apps unless you restart the subscription or, or resubscribe to the apps individually, depending on what you need. But this this sort of model is very smart, and the advantage that it's got for developers is developers are, can get a consistent amount of income uh, from their efforts from month to month, and a month, and that not only keeps their lights on, it helps fuel future development, keeps the ecosystem buoyant, keeps app developers uh, uh, working, and it, it, it a rising tide raises all boats, as Steve Jobs used to say. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, th- I think that the developers and customers alike have to make a very specific calculation on how often you use something, what the monthly fee is, and and frankly, what you know alternatives alternatives are out there, if any, and then make the make the decision. I'm 
I, I've, I've, I absolutely believe in, in the Smile app subscriptions, the One Password subscriptions. I think those are great things because those are apps that have, have they have a great history of development. They have a since they've gone to um, subscription models, they are developing. You can see the results of that, and so I'm, I'm with you. You know, it's, it, it's still it does seem like death by a thousand cuts. But on the other hand, if you really look at what you were paying for upgrades, maybe for some of the software and just divvy it out. You know, it's not as bad as you might think it is. It just feels different. Yeah, exactly. It's a different way of approaching it. But look, I mean, when, when you factor how much you're spending to Comcast or Time Warner, or whoever you get your cable from, and, uh, you know, what your other entertainment budgets are, I mean, software, you, you've got to consider as, 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 as a recurring expense as well. <laughs> the question that I've got is how long it's going to be before Apple moves into this model. You know, they, they, they had to get... Uh, drag kicking and screaming into uh, into Apple Music, you know, famously, you know, people didn't want to rent uh, music, they wanted to own it. Uh, but once they did, you know, it, quarter after quarter after quarter, you see Apple's notch of, of, of income, of revenue uh, coming from services growing, and it's growing on the back of services like Apple Music. Um, so I, I think it's inevitable that Apple is probably going to move into this space eventually. I wouldn't be surprised a year or two from now uh, for, for people to pay uh, a flat rate every month uh, to be able to unlock a subset of apps that are available from the Mac App Store. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And I think it makes sense for you know for the right developers under the right circumstances. I've said this a, a, a dozen times. The apps that I use once or twice a year, sorry, I, I'm not going to pay a subscription for them. But an app that I use every day, every hour, three times a week, yeah, those are those are ripe for subscriptions. No question. Yep. No question. So uh, in terms of other writing apps, BB Edit has been a mainstay of mine as a, as a text editor, like, a, you know, just a, a very high powered text editor f for nigh on 20 years now. Um, that that's probably my, my second favorite uh, tool to use uh, when it when it comes to writing. And uh, in terms of actual services, um, Grammarly um, has uh, uh, has been helpful. Uh, you know, I, as a freelancer, I don't have the benefit of, of having a full-time copy editor working with me. Uh, so, you know, it's nice to be able to run my copy through an automated filter anyway, and pick out some of the most egregious things that uh, I probably would have missed and been very embarrassed by if I had turned in that final copy to my client reading that way. So Grammarly has been very helpful as well. Hmm. Interesting. Didn't see that one coming. Makes perfect sense. Just didn't see it coming. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so question number two. I'm going to shift it a uh, completely different direction. I follow you on Twitter. I follow you on Facebook. You are reasonably prolific on both. And I'm curious as to what either tools or methodology you use to post and monitor your social networks. Interesting question. Facebook, I go the app and... Uh, uh, or I, I used to go the app, and I didn't because it started wasting battery on my iPhone egregiously. So I went with the web interface, which is uh, the mobile web interface for Facebook is horrible. It's appallingly bad. It's getting worse. Uh, but it gets me by when I'm mobile because, uh, you know, I just remember how bad the battery wastage was. Uh, when I had the app installed and don't really care to repeat the experience and don't really care actually for much of Facebook's invasive garbage when it comes to apps, like forcing me to use their Messenger app uh, to be able to message uh, friends of mine who use Facebook Messenger. Um, but uh, that's, that's, that's another rant for another time, I suppose. Uh, TweetDeck is my uh, client of choice. Uh, when it comes to uh, interacting on, on Twitter. I wish that there were a mobile uh, analog to TweetDeck, but I've really never found one. And I just use the Twitter app on my phone uh, when I'm mobile. But most of the time, if I'm in front of the, uh, or if, if I'm writing something, um, I'm or on social media, whether it's Twitter or Facebook, and those are the two main venues that I use. Um, I will uh, be doing it you know, from TweetDeck and from a web interface. I, I got, go kind of old school, but I'm kind of hardwired the way that, uh, uh, that, that, that I work. Now, do you, I'm not sure which one you post things in. Do you cross post automatically or do you intentionally post some things to one, some things to the other? You know, I did that for a long time, Chuck. And what I found is that uh, uh, because the, the two media, the, the two social media networks were so different, 
you know, Twitter is very rapid fire. Twitter is very um, broadcasting to a large audience. Um, uh, and of course, you know, the, the 140 character limit imposes certain. No, let me let me rephrase that should in theory, <laughs> at least and, and in practice for me imposes a certain mental discipline doesn't for everyone uh, in terms of how logarithmic one can get with one's bloviations. Um, I, I find that uh, uh, when I was cross posting from Twitter to Facebook, I was burning my Facebook friends out real quick uh, because, you know, I, I'll post to Twitter a lot more frequently and uh, with a lot more fire and fury, if you'll pardon the pun, uh, than I do uh, Facebook. So sometimes Facebook is 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 better for uh, longer form content. You know, I can actually get a thought out on Facebook that I can't do on Twitter. Uh, you know, Twitter too often feels like the mental version of a crowded elevator uh, that's going up one floor at a time. Uh, you know, Facebook kind of gives you the, the opportunity to breathe a little bit and get your uh, get your ideas out uh, and actually engender an interesting discussion, depending on who's on your friends list. Now, Chuck, you and I are friends in real life. So you're a Facebook friend of mine. I actually keep my Facebook um, account locked pretty, pretty tight. Um, I only let friends from real life or people who I've met in real life uh, into my Facebook account because that I, I wanted to keep that uh, that that aspect of my life I think a little bit more restricted than I do on Twitter. That's interesting and and a little surprising because you you are you do share a lot of thoughts and a lot of things and I'm just thinking back to some of your recent posts. I can understand why you would take that that uh, that tact and then there's some other posts that I would think you would want to get out there in a much broader, to a much broader audience. And often that's exactly what happens. You know, if I find that something resonates on, on one social network, I'll often post it or repost a similar thought on the other social network and see how it does. And it's really interesting to kind of compare and contrast uh, reactions to that. Now, those aren't the only two social networks I use, but those are probably my two primary interfaces. I'm also on Instagram and, you know, stuff like that. But I think that the Twitter and Facebook are probably the ones I use the most frequently. Yeah. I try to get into Instagram, but it doesn't, it just, I don't know, it, it just doesn't resonate with me. I love looking at the, the photos and everything, but Twitter and Facebook are kind of mine as well. Yeah. Mm. Um, and the, the kids with their Snapchats and, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, I just don't even understand. Yeah. Um, so so I want to make sure I get this right. On the Facebook side, you you say you used to use the, the iOS app, now you use the web interface. Is yeah. that... Uh, in other words, do you have your iPhone sitting beside you at all times and that's your Facebook machine or do you use the web interface on the on the Mac itself? Well, as I've intimated a few times, I'm really old school when it comes to uh, when it when it when it comes to computing and I really prefer a laptop whenever I can. So I would say probably 80 percent of the time if I'm interacting on a social network, if you see me posting anything on Twitter or Facebook, I'm doing it from a computer. Um, okay. I, I rarely, if ever, post or really carry on much of a thought at all uh, on either network uh, using a mobile device. There are exceptions to that, but they're few and far between. On uh, my uh, my my iPhone, when I am doing the social stuff, I'm either using the Twitter app or I'm using Facebook from Safari. Okay, interesting, interesting. I'm happy to welcome back Jamf as a sponsor of Mac Voices this week. Jamf now helps you manage your Apple devices from anywhere, simply and easily. There was a time that it wasn't that much of a chore to keep one or even two Apple devices up to date, managing the software that was on them and the documents they contained. Now though, we all have multiple devices. Whether it's just you alone with a Mac or two, an iPad and an iPhone or two, keeping track of them can be a little more daunting. Now, multiply that several times if you're a small business and then by a good solid factor of 10 if you're a larger business. And the situation becomes an even bigger challenge if the people using those devices don't play by your rules, either out of ignorance or out of intent. Then add multiple locations across the country or across the globe into the equation, and the fact that you might never actually touch those devices that you're charged with managing quickly becomes a nightmare. That's where Jamf Now comes in. With Jamf Now, you can configure the settings, protect sensitive information, lock a device, or even wipe a device if it's stolen, lost, or falls into the wrong hands. Better yet, Jamf makes it easy to do all this. Whether you're managing devices for yourself, your family, your small business, or a global enterprise, 
Jamf gets it done. You can get started now and find out just how easy it can be to manage your devices from anywhere by visiting jamf.com slash macvoices and sign up to start managing your first three devices for free. And I do mean free. No charge now, no charge ever for your first three devices. Discover Jamf's ease of use and how important it is to have control of your devices from anywhere, and then, for a couple of bucks a month per device, you can expand to cover all your devices, no matter how many devices you have. Create your free account right now and get started at jamf.com slash macvoices. That's J-A-M-F dot com slash macvoices. It doesn't cost a thing, and it will change the way you look at device management. Thanks to Jamf for their support of Mac Voices. You alluded to it earlier, but I'll ask you to give us a little more detail. One of the things I know about you is you are very eclectic in your musical tastes and your video tastes. And so what services do you subscribe to and and why do you choose those particular services? Well, let's see. Right now, uh, probably my longest running entertainment service is Netflix. Um, and, you know, Netflix gives me a new reason every month to... Uh, to stick with it, either through their own original content or content that they've uh, they've licensed for for uh, 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 for distribution. I you know have have an endless endless queue of Netflix stuff uh, ready to go. Uh, I am a fan of uh, Japanese animation or anime. Um, and have been all my life. I started with like uh, Gachaman and uh, uh, Space Battleship Yamato and uh, Speed Racer and Kimba the White Lion when I was a kid, Tetsujin. Uh, you know, I, I go old school with this stuff. Um, so I'm, I also uh, subscribe to a service called Crunchyroll. Uh, which imports a lot of that stuff from Japan, legally licensed. Um, and uh, uh, that way I'm able to support an industry that I care very much about instead of relying on piracy, like a lot of people um, uh, who are quote-unquote fans do. As far as I'm concerned, if you're pirating content, you're not a fan. You're a parasite. Uh, that goes for that goes double for software. No, it's the same for software. It's the same for any kind of content. If you derive, let me tell, let me get on my soapbox for a second, Chuck. If you derive any sort of benefit out of the effort of somebody else, that person deserves to be paid for it. This is why I feel as strongly as I do about software subscription services. I think that 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 uh, that, that you do owe. Uh, the developers whose apps you use a regular paycheck. You know, if if you're getting continued benefit out of out of their stuff, just like if you've got a guy mowing your lawn, you don't just pay him once to mow your lawn. You pay him every time your lawn gets mowed. If you get, um, uh, if 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 you get uh, gas for your car, or if you buy a new car, you don't get free gas. Well, you might get free gas a little bit as a promotion from the from uh, the the from from uh, the the uh, the car salesman, but in all likelihood, you're going to be paying for gas, and at some point or another, you're going to be paying for maintenance on that vehicle too. If you use something, you know you've got to continue to pay uh, if you're going to derive benefit out of it. I feel the same way about entertainment. So, uh, Crunchyroll was my way of saying, you know what, pirates, uh, screw you. I I don't want anything to do with you anymore. I'm going to get what I can get out of Crunchyroll, uh, and that's where I'm going to get my anime fix from. So there's some stuff that I can't watch because uh, Crunchyroll hasn't licensed it, uh, or it's not available, or uh, whatever. Uh, but uh, Crunchyroll definitely helps me soothe that uh, Jones. So that's it on the video side, I think. On the uh, music side, I um, use a bunch of free services like Spotify and stuff like that. The only ones I actually pay for, though, are Apple Music, and uh, di.fm, digitally imported, uh, which uh, plays a lot of electronic music. Mm, not familiar with that one. Well, I'm a big fan of uh, house music, especially, and uh, 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 dance music. It's sort of the running soundtrack of my life, if you will. Uh, I use it for workouts. Um, I use it to motivate myself when I'm working. Uh, it's great driving music for me. It's 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 meditative in a way, uh, but it's also you know got that dance beat. So uh, you know it, it gets my blood pumping and it just gets me in the zone. Uh, so di.fm was an easy decision for me to make when it came time to uh, uh, to pay up for that one. Do you have, out of curiosity, compared to Apple Music, um, do you have any idea what that costs? Uh, di.fm I pay for on an annual basis, so I think uh, it's about $5 a month. It's $60 a year. Okay. Okay. 
Interesting. Interesting. I, exactly what I'd expected, Peter. I know you're going to come up with answers that I didn't see coming. So and That's what I'm here for, Chuck. That's, yeah, I, I like it. I like it. Uh, so let's see. Where else should we go? Um, I think that was number three, if, uh, that was. if, if memory serves. Um, okay. So since you are a heavy iPhone user, what would you say your top three iPhone apps, top three used iPhone apps are? Uh, do you, do we want to go based on um, based on on how much battery usage? <laughs> well, if that's the way, it's the best measurement, sure. Or if that's you would... that, that's one measurement, and it's probably a pretty accurate one because that tells you how much. I mean, it, telling you how much juice the, your apps burn through gives you a real clear indication of how much you're using them, right? Um, and I, I I've got actually a kind of an embarrassing confession to make. My number one used app on my phone, and it's been like this for years, is a game uh, from Supercell. Uh, the people who make Clash of Clan, uh, Clash of Kings and stuff like that, uh, called uh, Heyday. It's a it's their Farmville uh, variant. Uh, that is my absolute number one app. I play it probably seven or eight times a day. Uh, basically, anytime I've got like five minutes and and I just want to lose my mind in the game loop for a little bit, I will fire up Heyday and farm my stuff and sell my wares and make my town uh, visitors happy and feed my livestock and the whole nine yards. It is my guiltiest pleasure. Again, didn't see that one coming. Okay. <laughs> uh, that, Twitter, and uh, Safari are the three most uh, frequently used apps in terms of battery usage on my phone. So that gives you a pretty good pretty good indication. The rest of them, uh, you know, I, I use uh, music a, a lot, obviously. Uh, DI.fm, again, that's an app on the phone. Um, and uh, uh, map apps, uh, especially Waze. Waze is, you know, indispensable, especially where I live. I live in a... Uh, a tourist area that's uh, uh, very heavily trafficked during the summertime. So uh, being able to, to know about pop-up accidents and uh, traffic stops and stuff like that, very helpful for me. Uh, down that, that path for a second, I, I know where you live, and I know something about the tourists in that, in that area. Um, okay, now you're keeping me out, Chuck. No, 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 not that way, <laughs> but in general. Um, have you done any, any like, just personal self-use um, testing to determine whether Apple Maps or, or Waze or Google Maps or anything give you the best routes, or is it that, is it that uh, driver feedback that you get from Waze that is the deciding factor for you? You know what? Um, I would have to give Waze the edge right now. I think Waze provides better user experience and more pertinent information uh, than any of the other apps. Um, I, it's, it's obviously not consistent and not accurate 100 percent of the time. Uh, you know, I'm often, you know, scratching, you know, accident notes, you know, that, that other people haven't bothered to um, to to to. Uh, uh, to, to let ways know about our, our clear and stuff like that. So, you know, there, there's some of that obviously, but, um, all told it's, it, it, it's a great app and I would have to give it the edge. Um, but I, I don't think that any of the apps replace common sense, uh, driving. Uh, you know, I, I know the area that I live in, uh, better than these apps do. And I also know that, uh, to get from point A to point B is not always a straight line affair or is not always the the long or the shortest route as uh, you might be able to predict based on whatever heuristics you're using to calculate that information, right? Um, I know that I would rather spend an extra five minutes taking this back road to that back road and taking this right turn and that left turn to exit at that light so I can cut across that intersection rather than getting backed up in that other intersection a quarter of a mile because that's the way the lights are set. That's the sort of stuff that you only know when you've got the experience of going through it. Um, and, and, you know, as, as a driver, I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to pay attention to that stuff and to know that stuff. Um, I take driving very seriously. I love to drive. Um, so I don't want to be distracted by my devices either. And, and that's, that's another reason why I always think that, that Waze, Apple Maps, Google Maps, whatever you're using, needs to take a backseat to your two eyes and your gray matter. Uh, very, very wise. Very wise. But I, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I found Apple Maps to be, I think, best for straight directions, but I'm always driving with Waze because there's nothing that that uh, that replaces that that immediate feedback from the guy that's two miles ahead of you that, you know, sees that somebody just hit a deer, at least in my part of the country, hit, hit deer. Um, you know, you've, okay, I, I know that. I know what to expect. Um, or, you know, or frankly, the, the speed trap that just popped up. 
you know, that that's invaluable. And that's something that none of the other services duplicate. So. Indeed, and that's something that Waze, Waze has taken a lot of criticism and, and a lot of public scrutiny for. Um, so it's, it's, it's a good service that they offer, and I'm glad that they do it. And I think it's important public information to know. Yeah, absolutely. So join me, join Peter, and use Waze. Yeah. Yes. Okay, last question. This episode of Mac Voices brought to you. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, well, if, if we can make it happen, that's great. Waze, call me. Um, so, Peter, the last question is a bit broader um, and not, not as specific. You, you've been at this game for a while, not Heyday, but the writing game and the organization game and everything. Heyday, too. Listen, my Heyday game is on point. I've got like two million gold pieces in this game. No, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm a Heyday master. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go I, on. I don't even know what that means, but okay. Um, do you have any other tools? Now, we talked about your writing tools, but do you have any other tools that that are essential to organize your life and your job and everything around it? And you can you can name calendars, you can name mind mapping programs, whatever it is that works for you, that uh, that is part of your personal formula for getting things done. Sure, Chuck. So um, as I as I've I've said a couple of times now, uh, I predominantly use my Macintosh. So I'm going to stick to the Mac uh, for for this for the most part. I think uh, the 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 stuff that I find indispensable, the things that I install on my Mac, like before I put anything else on a new machine. Uh, Bajango's uh, iStat Menus, uh, which is a, a cool little app that provides a lot more diagnostic uh, information than uh, the operating system, the Mac operating system will give you. You can look at your CPU temperature, memory load, uh, uh, hard drive load, how much network traffic you're doing, um, uh, what what what's what fee, how how many RPMs your span your fans are spinning, uh, what the temperature of your CPU is. Really in depth information if you want it. It's a cool little tech tool. Uh, that I like to use because I like to know what's going on under the hood of these things, especially now that Apple makes them so you can't take them apart that easy, you know, if at all. Um, so, so that's one. I think another one that uh, that I install, I, and I used to work for this company, I I, uh, I don't anymore, but I'm still b big, a big believer in their product is Backblaze, uh, which is a, a, a backup program. Uh, subscription-based uh, backup program that backs up the contents of your Mac um, to a uh, secure cl cloud service. The reason why I use this, because I, I use a time machine backup too, and in fact, I've got a time capsule backup for a second layer of, of, um, of, uh, of, of, of backup um, locally. But that's not enough. If something happens, if I had a fire, God forbid, I would lose both my uh, time capsule backup and my Mac and my uh, time machine backup. So what would I do then? It's really important in any kind of backup strategy to have three copies of your data. One, your local copy that's on your computer. Two, a local backup. Like I said, my time machine backup. That's what most of us do. And then three, an offsite backup that is stored in a secure location. So if something happens to one and two, you still have your data somewhere in the cloud. Now, you don't necessarily need to use backup, uh, Backblaze or CrashPlan or any other kind of uh, backup software or backup service to do that. You could use iCloud. You could use Dropbox. You could use uh, you know, Microsoft's thing. You could use whatever you want, Google Drive. As long as you've got your most important data securely backed up to an off-site location, you know, using appropriate encryption, making sure that your stuff is secure, that is the most important thing. So that is uh, one of the most vital things that, that I put on any new machine. Beyond that, there aren't a lot of apps that I absolutely need beyond the ones that I've already mentioned, like Ulysses, for example, and uh, BB Edit. Um, I do really like um, uh, to use um, uh, 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 Bartender uh, to keep my uh, Mac menu uh, very clean. I don't like to see a lot of third-party apps and services, sorry, Backblaze, um, up on uh, my menu bar uh, when I'm working. I like a very clean, simple, austere interface. And Bartender uh, is a very useful little uh, little tool uh, to help me manage that. So that's another thing that I use. Uh, calendaring solution? I, I, I'm a traditionalist. I use Apple's calendar app. It fascinates me. I, I hear so many people say that, and, and nothing wrong with that, folks. But there's so many great calendaring apps out there. I'm just, I'm always surprised that somebody says yeah, that that's, that's good enough for me. And if it is, there's nothing wrong with that. It just surprises me. 
Yeah. Now, there's one other app that I uh, install right away on any new machine that probably isn't everyone's cup of tea. But for me as a news junkie, not only for tech news, but also for general news, uh, you know, I'm, I go old school again. You know, I've been I've been on the, the Internet since the early 90s. So um, I still use a uh, RSS newsreader. Uh, and uh, Black Pixel's Net Newswire is my uh, RSS reader of choice. Um, I I love it. I, I use it every day to catch up um, on the, the the feeds from the websites that I find most important, uh, and it's a really indispensable app for me. That is probably that's actually I'm looking at my menu bar right now. Uh, that is probably the only other um, third party app that I really use that frequently, um, besides the stuff I've already mentioned, like Adobe products, uh, Ulysses, uh, BB Edit, uh, maybe Mars Edit actually, Mars Edit from Red Sweater software. That's a really cool app. That's one I use uh, quite frequently. Peter, I, I kind of expected this. I expected I'd know some of the answers. I expect I wouldn't know some of the answers and you you did not uh, disappoint me. It's, 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 I think it's fascinating just to see, you know, we all, I think we all have certain tools in common, but then we find those little niche tools or the things that, that make our lives different. And sometimes, you know, you have a good choice between mainstream tools and, you know, so why do you pick one instead of the other? So thank you. Interesting. Very interesting. You're welcome, Chuck. I'd love to share. Yeah. Um, so where can folks, well, we've talked about your social media presences, but uh, outline those and where else can they find what you're doing now? Well, if you and I know each other in real life, uh, hit me up on Facebook and I'm, I'm happy to friend you. Uh, otherwise, uh, let's wait a little bit on that. Uh, the, 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 the place where you can find most of my uh, verbal spewing is Twitter. Uh, my handle is Flarg, F-L-A-R-G-H. Uh, and I also have a website of my own, Peter-Cohen, C-O-H-E-N dot com. And, uh, you know, my, my byline pops up on everybody's site every once in a while. So uh, uh, if you subscribe to me, my, my site on social media, or if you uh, take a look at my website, chances are uh, you'll, you'll see that stuff pop up there from time to time, too. Great. Are you on Tinder? No. Oh, I just, you know, I didn't know, I mean, how people are going to get to know you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we're 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 going to leave it at at uh, at uh, at uh, at Twitter for now. I okay, think. Okay. <laughs> Peter, thanks so much. It's great to see you. Nice to see you, Chuck. We'll do it again. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> folks. I'm Chuck Joyner. I hope you've enjoyed this. I certainly have. And I every time I do these five questions, I learn something. I've, I've got to go back and review my notes as to what I've learned from Peter. Maybe it's that I need to do more heyday. I don't know. Until the next time, and as always. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes, links to subscribe, and to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, SoundCloud, the Mac Voices blog, the Mac Voices Dispatch, our weekly newsletter, and on Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard that helps you do more with your Apple tech. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.